we'll start over here. Carlos is in the Redlands office, um, has just been killing it for several years. Wow. And I, yeah, all right, give Carlos some love. Um, again, when we go through the panel, we'll give everybody a chance to kind of do their own bio. bio. He may have something more to add than just killing it for several years. Um, but at any rate, I asked Carlos to, to sit on the panel because um, I have some specific questions. Um, and we've kind of touched on him a little bit already. He's doing some pretty interesting stuff on Yelp that he may want to share with us and um, give us a little bit of the secret sauce. Um, maybe not all of it, but maybe a little bit. Um, Charlene, I had the pleasure of meeting Charlene when we acquired the Claremont Covina office back in 2010-ish. And Charlene has just been a staple in the Claremont market forever with her team of Colette and with Mike. They're just, um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the Claremont market and you're looking on how you might want your business to look in five years or 10 years, I would suggest maybe you ask um, um, Charlene, I was going to, I look at you and I always want to say Colette and Charlene, I always get you guys like they're sisters for God's sakes. Um, I would suggest you might ask Charlene out to lunch and say, hey, how did, because we, we, I don't know whether we're going to go for five minutes or an hour and five minutes here this afternoon, but she has a business model which I respect and is, is, is very traditional and I'm not sure traditional works in 2017. But if traditional does work in 2017, this is the model that I think you want to emulate. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk a little bit, obviously, give Charlene an opportunity to kind of tell us a little bit more about the secret sauce. Um, Chris has been with me in Moreno Valley now for seven years. I believe you came into our office, you were answering phones, literally in our call center. And has just been a, kind of like, I'll use the same verbiage with Carlos that I used with, with Chris, or vice versa. Is he's just been killing it. Um, you know, he's started to build a team, um, doing very, very well, extremely well versed um, and, and, and fearless, in my words, as it relates to the social media and some of the stuff that he's doing on video, which is one of the main reasons I brought him up here. I wanted to have him chat with us a little bit about that. And Fred is a newer agent. Fred has been with our Covina office now for a year, maybe a little bit less than a year. New on the block. New kid on the block. <laughs> so, um, I thought it wouldn't hurt, and it's had some success. I don't know if his success is what his business plan, you know, where he projected himself to be on November 1st of 2018. But from where I'm sitting, I think as a brand new agent who is literally new to the business, coming out of another career, had some success in another career, um, has done pretty darn well with some of the practices and stuff that he's put forward. Um, I don't know if it's translated into the number of transactions maybe you would have wished at this point, but I, I, I see Fred as a rising star here in the company, so I thought it might be not a bad idea to bring him up. So let's do this. I've given them their introductions, so let's see if they have anything to add specifically kind of about who they are and, and what, you know, what they're all about. So let's start with Carlos and work our way back down to Fred. Thank you, Lance. I've been into the company now for about six years and uh, started out uh, working my way up and trying to compete with some of the other agents in the office and uh, I've taken the last uh, several years to really build up my reputation as far as online reviews and so forth and that's kind of like how I've started to get to where I want to be and uh, pretty much every year I set a goal kind of for where I want to be as far as transactions and dollars per month that I make and I've pretty much consistently hit that for the last five years in a row. So it's started to pay off, and now it's just a matter of expanding it and growing my team, as you mentioned, to uh, handle basically more business than I, ha I can handle by myself right now. So that's where I'm at with my, with my business. Okay, so he's setting goals. It sounds like he's hitting them and maybe even exceeding them. Yeah. And just to bring in the personal side of this, how many children do you have and what are their ages? Three kids. Uh, one is uh, four. 12 and 19. 4, 12, and 19. So it is a bit of a juggle trying to, you know, be so a dad and father and right. also a successful businessman, too. That's right. And it, yeah. so it can be done. Right. It, it can be done. And I, a lot if, of work, though. A lot if, of work and a lot of hours. Yep. And if you're not doing this, I, and I would suggest this for everybody on the panel, is if you're not following or friends with Carlos on his social media, I would suggest that you do. Um, and one of the things that I noticed with Carlos, which is why I mentioned his family and his kids, 
is you, I don't know whether this is by design or. It is by design. But he has a very nice balance with his social media. Of, this is kind of Carlos, Cobalt Banker, Town and Country. I'm a realtor. And this is Carlos. Hey, I just drove my, my, my kid up to. I want to see if I can connect with my clients when they see me online. Yep. Yeah, they can kind of relate to me as a you know a father and a, and, and also a person right. rather than just a realtor. Well, and it connects with me, and it mm -hmm. certainly connects with my wife. My wife is the social media stalker. So for any of the you guys that are friends with me on Facebook, I spend a fair amount of time looking at social media. But my wife will go through and and, and literally um, more so with yeah. Carlos and Chris. I don't know that Shirley. Do you have a Facebook page? Are you doing anything? Okay, Charlene's got a, Char, Charlene has a different model, okay, different model, and we're going to talk a lot about that model here in a little bit. Um, but I know specifically with, with Carlos and with Chris specifically is my wife is not a real estate person. She's been in the business on and off for years, but she certainly connects with the personal stuff. And she'll point out, to, oh, Carlos is going up to... Um, up north with the daughter for college again, or <clears throat> had the kids at the beach this in San Diego, whatever it happens to be. And I see that stuff, and I find that, not that the real estate posts have kind of just go past me, because <laughs> I look at that stuff too, but I'm looking at it from a little different mindset. I'm not necessarily, you know, the, I don't know that the cons consumer, the average consumer and I look at it the same way, but the personal stuff is nice. And he's got a four-year-old and a college, you know, bound daughter, so, and doing pretty, pretty, pretty nice business. Charlene. Tell us a little more about yourself. Um, I started with Coal Banker uh, 31 years ago. Awesome. Some of you might not even have been born. <laughs> and I'll probably go out with my toes up. So anyway, and then um, in 1990, I met my life partner, Mike. He's over there. And he was a realtor. Mm -hmm. Sat in back of me, and I smiled at him, and he smiled at me, and that was it. <laughs> And then some years later, we decided to be business partners also, because for a while we were just doing our own separate business. And then about 10 years ago, we brought um, our dearest friend, uh, Colette Albanese, who's there also. And uh, we brought her on board because we had no life otherwise, because anybody that's really doing real estate full time knows that the minute you put your suitcase down on the, on the bed to fill it is when all the phone calls start. And so we brought Colette along and uh, on board with us, and she's our business partner, and we share everything. And it's just the perfect team because we have a balance of Mike does a lot of the technology stuff, and Colette and I are out in front, and we cover for one another. And it's, it's, that's why when he asked me earlier how long I would stay in the business, and I said, as long as I have Mike and Colette by my side, probably forever. So, and I want to thank Lance for inviting me because it gave me an interesting opportunity to think about why I do business the way, or why we now, but it started with me, why I, why I do the business the way I do. So we'll move on because I think we're going to get back to this conversation again. But it, is, it was fascinating because I had to think about how I got to where I am today and why I'm doing business the way I am. And it's very, it's very interesting to think about it. But at least I thought it was. Yeah. Okay. Well, and we're going to keep me. this real conversational. I don't want this to be formal and stuffy and, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. But I want to touch base on something that Charlene just said as it relates to when she was kind of introducing Colette and, and, and Mike. You know, they're a team, OK? And they, they work together. It's not that you know, they're, you know, they're my assistant or they work for me or anything like that. When you have a successful relationship like they have, and I, I just, just observing them from afar, they are, they are truly a team and they work together as such. And, it's, it, and that's the only way I believe that those, those can be successful. Building, building a, a hierarchy of these are the employees and these are the staff and building a, a, a successful team like Charlene has done, it doesn't work that way. Um, and I certainly have seen that. And obviously, you and Mike have a, a, a unique and special relationship, mm -hmm. but the same relationship with Colette. I mean, they're equals as far as I can tell. Well, people when are so, sometimes if they, if we've come on the scene without the referral from people years ago that know me personally, or they're younger people, they've been referred, but they don't know me personally, they often, they don't know who they're talking to. They call one, you think you confuse us, it's Charlotte, 
Colleen. Oh, yeah. It is so funny. They don't know who they're interacting with because we interact, we are so interchangeable. And, and I have to say that in all my years with Colette, it's because sometimes we're not there to make decisions for one another, uh, to make decisions together. Somebody has to make a decision on the spot. Never, truly never have we disagreed about right. anything that that other person makes, regardless of what the decision is in a transaction. And that's, that's remarkable. Right. In a, in and it's probably safe to say you guys trust each other 100% oh, with how you do yeah. your business. That goes yep. Just a little bit. Just a little did, bit strong. Strong personalities. Yeah, uh, yeah strong oh, no. personalities. Trust me. Dog. Trust me. You come into a sales meeting, and I, I'll sit in the corner, and I'll see Charlene come in and Colette behind her, and sometimes there's just this eye contact that's made, and it tells me everything I need to know of what's going to happen for the rest of the morning. Um, yeah, yeah, a little bit of but But, hey, this is a real estate business. This is a business. And we are salespeople, and frankly, in my experience, successful people in this business, frankly, do tend to be strong A-type personalities. Um, not always, but at any rate. Okay, Mr. Leeper, what you got to say for yourself? I, I actually hope that I run into that same problem as a really, really good partner, and people forget who I am, because that would be a good That's thing a in my deal. business. Um, I, most of what I do on a regular basis, you guys can all find on social media. I'm, I've been kind of branded the social media guy, and I don't know if that's because of my age. I'm 32 years old, so you've yeah, been in the business 31, but um, I just grew up with this stuff, so <laughs> it just kind of comes natural to me. Um, you mentioned the video thing of you, you, I make it look natural. That's only because I've screwed up for the last seven years doing video. Right. When people came out and said do video seven years ago, I started doing video, and it was terrible. So you guys all talk you know, down on your guys' stuff. It just takes time. So don't be so hard on yourself, and I totally agree. Get over it. Get over it and do it. We're in a uh, video marketing world first, and you're going to get left behind. I mean, that, that's just the reality of where it's at. Um, but to, to kind of talk on Carlos's point, I don't have a wife. I have a fiance. I don't have any kids. I eat, sleep, and breathe real estate, so you go to my social pages and it's going to be the majority of business because that's what I do and that's who I am. Um, obviously, I try to go out and hit the desert every once in a while and, and do some social things as well, but the majority of my life is my business, so I, you know, I look at these guys and I'm like amazed because I don't know how you juggle <laughs> the family life and work. I just, thankfully, I can just pour myself into my job, so that's where I'm at. Fair enough. Fred? My name is Fred C. of Ocean. I don't know why I'm sitting up here, <laughs> <laughs> except that I know that uh, uh, Paul uh, hired me last year about this time, but I didn't do anything with the business till uh, March because uh, I was so busy I had to make time for this business. And uh, uh, since uh, March, uh, Norm has been my uh, a trainer, Lance, my mentor, uh, Drake and Drew have been a great help, and Ingrid, great cheerleader. And I really appreciate uh, every one of them because we have a great team. Um, Lance and I did some uh, business planning around uh, May, I think, th this year. And uh, this, is a, this is a transition year for me from one uh, job into, I don't want to say another job because that can easily be the, the problem. And I think Lance has been talking about this as a business. That's what I plan on doing with the real estate, to have a business, not another job. <clears throat> right now, based on the business plan we put together, I'm about 80% there, number of sales and all of that. And um, I plan on uh, tripling that next year. And I do have a business plan that would allow me to do that. And uh, thank you, Lance, for letting me talk. Well, welcome. Welcome. OK, so there's, there's this. We've set the stage. So um, I'm going to just throw out some softball questions. We'll kind of see what's going on. But Ingrid's going to walk around with the mic. So let's, we're not going to wait till the end to do a Q&A. So if something pops into your head, if somebody says something and that sounds good or you have more 
questions, just, just raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll get Ingrid to put a mic in your face and we'll see what we can do. So this is where I want to start. And I don't necessarily know that I want to kind of go through the entire panel and have each one ask the exact or answer the same question. So we'll kind of throw it out there. And if you think you have something that's, hey, I want to, I want to jump in on that, just kind of raise your hand. And if all of you have something that you want to jump in and say, I think this would be fun, um, well, we'll give all of you a chance. So I want to start with one of the slides that we had earlier talked about what type of agent do you want to be, okay? And to give these guys a little bit of help, and if you remember, I was saying, well, that's kind of a loaded question. You know, do I want to be a listing agent? I'm going to do residential. Do I want to do commercial? Do I want to work, you know, 80 hours a, a, a week and just nonstop or no? I'm, I'm not, I don't want to do that exactly. I'm at a little different place in my life or maybe I've got some family. So. I'm just kind of curious as to if you guys have a, a, a good answer to, not necessarily, well, maybe it's two answers. What type of agent are you today? How often, are, how hard are you working? What are your goals? Are you primarily listing? Are you doing a lot of social? And then maybe what you, where you see yourself a year or two or three from now, um, if there is any difference from where you are today. Um, so I'll I, jump in. I'm, I'm primarily a listing agent at this point. I do have an amazing buyer's agent on my team, Stacy. She's in the room. So I don't work hardly any buyers. Um, some of the referrals coming from past clients and things like that, I'll work them if they're specifically requesting me. Primarily a listing agent, and I'd like to transfer out of that into more of like the team lead facilitator type. So that's where I am today, and you know, three, five year goal, become more of the team lead CEO type figure with more people underneath. Running a bigger team. Running a slightly, slightly larger team. I don't want to go big, huge, mega team at this point. Okay. I kind of wanted to be more of a balanced type agent between sales or between listings and, and buyers. I, I think that may, may have come from like my experience for the last 12 years. It's, I don't like to get comfortable in one, in one, and uh, too, too much, too comfortable on one side or the other. I like to have a good uh, balance of both, so that way I know I have business. Either way, if it's a seller's market, I have business. If it's a buyer's market, I have business there too. So I like having that experience on both sides. Uh, I definitely want to build up a smaller team and kind of run it like Chris is, is mentioning. Uh, nothing too big, maybe four or five, six agents to handle different buyers and, and eventually help me out so, more so that if I have too much on my plate, I can kind of trust a few of them to take over and, and help carry the load. Um, I kind of see myself doing this for maybe another 10 years, and then after that, who knows, we'll see. But I really want to, I, I work really hard, though. I work very hard, and I put a lot of hours into it, so it's a, it's a pretty hard pace to keep up. Let, let's, and I want to, I don't know, if, Shirley, if you had something off the top of your head, but I want to bring that same question back to you, but before, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm working really hard, a lot of hours, what does that mean? I How start at 6.30 in the morning, and I probably end like, 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night. It's not like, you know, it's not really super hard physical labor, of course, but it's a lot of answering phones, uh, following up with leads, computer work, paperwork, managing. It's just a whole gamut of things you have to do to kind of make sure you're on top of everything and making sure the business is continuing. So, so you're itself. basically on yeah. from, I'm assuming you get up somewhere close to 6. Yeah. And, and you shut off around 9, 9 p.m. 9.30. Okay. Yeah. And Chris? Uh, I'm probably closer to like, well, it's tough. I do a lot of business at the bar. I have, I'm, I'm 32 years old. We go, out, we go out a lot. I play softball. So, I mean, I'm doing deals with guys on the softball field at 1030 at night. I mean, that's not my normal thing. I would say nine to nine, basically seven days a week. Um, but again, I, I do a lot of business sitting at the bar, hanging out with friends. So, I mean, I'm talking real estate at three o'clock in the morning with right. a group of people relatively on a normal basis. Right. So to the degree that we never shut it off, we kind of never shut it off. But um, okay, so Charlene, let's, let's do it in reverse. How many hours a day, week do you think you're working on average? And, and, and what type of agent? And, and if to the you degree- You can ask Mike. <laughs> or, or is it just, is, is it kind of like just, never stops. It's never stops. It, I mean, it's, it's always there. And we get up in the morning and the first thing I'll do is check on the internet yep. and then we'll go, we'll go walking, jogging, whatever, exercise, do aerobics. Um, and we're out, come back, check again. Might have to talk to Colette if we're doing something, get dressed. If, if I have to have an appointment, we try to make our appointments about mid morning. 
if we need to, but we check everything, check the escrow, check the, what's going on with everything. If phone calls come in, you answer them back. So it's ongoing, ongoing. It goes on all day. We'll go out for appointments. We come back. We'll have a little snack. Um, and then we start again. And, and Mike, of course, will stop at a certain point because he's smarter than I am. <laughs> so he'll just go. My well, office. Work is, so hard. He's a lot smarter. So my office is here. Our office is here. And then the living room is right there. And so he'll just get up from his chair, which is right next to mine, and he'll say, OK, sweetheart. <laughs> And he goes into the living room and he sits down and he starts reading his book or he'll watch something on TV or a ball game or whatever. And I'm still working away like a, it's, a, it's, a, you're, it's kind of your neurotic in a way. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's, it's definitely. It's, and again, we've got, I think this is great stuff. Especially we have a lot of newer people in the business. As a matter of fact, who, who's not in the business right now? There's one or two of you that um, are just here thinking about, is this something I want to do? Um, if, and if you would come to me as, 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 as hey, I'm thinking about a career in real estate, um, I kind of go through a little bit of this and I say, watch some videos. But, but this is the type of stuff that if you're not in the business, you need to be aware of. Or if you are in the business and you're thinking, oh, I could be one of these guys, but I want to do it Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, this Forget might be it. a little bit of a rude awakening for you from a standpoint of how you, how you shut this off. And the problem is, it, the Monday through Friday 9 to 5 is, is a terrible description. And whenever I ask anybody, how many hours a week do you work? And, 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 and nor, it's a, almost an impossible, it's impossible. question. Eat, sleep, um, yeah. and, and in some, in some cases, this is, this is kind of pathetic, OK? And I'll give you the following example, OK? <laughs> uh, last night, I mean, World Series, baby, right? I mean, it's the World Series. And I'm sending text messages about business in the fifth inning of the game, you know? And, and I don't know whether it's a sickness or just stupidity, or maybe I need to hang out with Mike a little bit more and, yeah. just, and, 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 and shut it. So in other words, the example is, is you would think, and I'm not saying you can't do this, but you would think that we can shut that off and leave that phone in our pocket for four hours of a baseball game. But for me, I have a problem with that. And I don't know whether that's just a problem in my lifestyle or whether that's a little bit of a secret sauce to our success, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., 10 p.m. at the baseball game. I mean, he's not shutting it down at the baseball game. You know, he's having fun and having a great time, but there's always something going on. And, and Charlene sounds like you're like always most excited. It's, it's always on. That's the on. problem also with, um, with the emails, because before I used to have to make phone calls. And after about 9 o'clock at night, Mike would lean over and from the living room and say, that lucky person that's going to get this phone call, it's a little late. So I'd stop with that. But with emails, you can keep emailing all night. Right. And there yep. I am, and I type fast, and I email a lot. Colette will say, all stop, night. stop. Real, real, it's gotten even worse than the emails, because I don't do that email thing at all. But I'll still get text messages at 1130 at night from clients that want to know what the hell is going on. That's right. Nothing and, and, worse. And that's part of the business, though, with the text messages and the emails. I, I think the clients and even us, we kind of figure, well, let's just send it out. If something comes back, great. If not then we'll deal with it in the morning. But the expectation, I believe, with the client is if they send us something. I know you guys are this way. If you text me 9, 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, generally, unless I'm just passed out drunk somewhere, <laughs> you're going to get a reply back from me. And the reply back might be, huh, OK, this is a long conversation. Let's talk in the morning. But my expectation is that your expectation is that you, you're going to want to reply especially if it's a text. Not a lot of people, we seem to be respectful. We're not calling each other at 9, 10 o'clock at night in most cases. But um, OK, so along those same lines, is there ever a time when we shut it off? Do we go on vacation oh, and, yeah. and truly shut it off? Done. On so on vacation, you do? Oh, done. Colette, and, she, and we, have a, we have a plan. Don't bother the other person unless somebody's dead. OK. <laughs> OK, so. So you do take oh, a, a weekend or a week, and oh. you're no phones, no text, no email, no nothing. We'll go on no a nothing. cruise. Mike and I are ballroom dancers, and we'll go off on a cruise. And I really, unless it's a total emergency, 
I don't want to hear from anybody. And none of my clients care because they adore Colette because we're working together all the time. And they, when, we're, when we're in Claremont or wherever we are, we'll, we'll be together when we don't even need to be because it's much more fun when we're together. We have a, a lots of fun when we're with clients and it's the two of us. Sometimes we have to divide and conquer so we don't have time to, to do things together. But the clients adore either one of us. So it doesn't, and that's the key when you have a partner. Otherwise, you can forget it. Right. When I first was in the business and I'd have somebody taking over for me, this is what I heard. Oh, they were okay, but it wasn't you. Right. That, you know, that might be great for your ego for about one second, but it isn't good for your business. Yep. So if you're thinking of having a partner, be careful that you partner with somebody that thinks like you do, has the, the, the ethics that you do and the ideals that you do. And I have two partners like that. And so that's why we're very fortunate. But, you, but going back to the trust, you trust them enough to do that. Oh, um, Carlos, I don't, do you have anybody that you trust? Can you shut it off? Do you ever shut it off? Uh, not yet. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. So when you're on, when you're on vacation, on you're On vacation, still I still answer emails oh. and texts. Right. I, I sometimes I'll take like an hour early in the morning before my kids and wife wake up like 5 and 5.36 and, and uh, I'll check the computer and you know send out emails and do stuff online and then uh, hopefully try and enjoy the rest of the day for the vacation and then maybe at, late at night again check it again before I go to sleep so yeah. You ask yeah, my assistant uh, she tells you I shut down all the time but in reality it doesn't actually happen that way. Um, you had a question in the back. Oh Ingrid question. Oh. Hi there. Uh, yeah, this is uh, for sure. Oh, do I have to yes. stand up? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Terry, Kavina office. Uh, Charlene, I have a question for you. You uh, have your great trustworthy assistant. And what I wanted to ask you is Thank you. before you ended up getting this great partnership with the um, assistants that you have or your partners, how many did you go through to find that person? Well, Mike was sitting in back of me when he came into the office. And like I said, we smiled at each other. And so I had Mike for a long time as my partner. But Colette was the crucial one because, I mean, not that Mike wasn't crucial too, but Colette was crucial for our business because when Mike and I, when we had our partnership, we were fine, but we were together. When we'd go on a trip, we both went on the same trip. So then we had no one. I had a couple of people that helped me, but I was very fortunate because Colette was in the office. She had a partner. The partner got married and moved away and wanted Colette to go with her, and she said no because the partner wanted to go off to a different area, I think outside of Rancho Cucamonga or something, and Colette was living in Claremont. She said, no, I want to stay and, and, and establish my business in Claremont, which she hadn't done. She'd done a lot of real estate, but she hasn't really established herself in any one community. She was working in a lot of different communities. So we needed somebody, and so I saw her, and I watched her, and I talked to her a little bit, and I asked her if she'd help me on the transaction, and she did, and then we watched her again. And it just evolved, and I just feel every day of my life how lucky we are uh, to have her because it's very rare to find that kind of a partnership. Yeah, that just to speak to that really quickly, Charlene, that then the relationship that she has with Mike and Colette, that is unusual, okay, and especially to, to have the success as quickly as you and had. Especially my personality, because I yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> no truly that's right. because it's a no, very Doug 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 mentioned that earlier <laughs> that, that that strong personality. Uh, okay, so the reason that I was asking you is because um, me being in the business now for a little over eight years, everybody has always been telling me, you should build a team, build a team, Terry. But I'm one of those type of people that if I am not controlling it, I feel like it's not going to get perfectly 100% yep. done. Yep. And get so that's it. where it's hard. It's like, who do you know? You know, do you go by trial and error? you know, just by watching someone, interviewing someone, is how do you start the team, you know? Well, the thing was with Colette is that what Colette, I'm, I'm not dealing with Mike now because, you know, Mike and I are together. I'm talking about somebody taking over when we're gone. So that's why I'm emphasizing Colette at the moment. The thing with Colette is she had, well, I have to be really honest. The thing with Colette is that we're both Sicilian. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. 
It was like our mothers who are, because you know, she's the age of my, of my children. But we were raised identically. We have mothers that could have been sisters. So there's an unspoken understanding that came from day one that we didn't, never had to talk about because we were both raised identically. So that helped. And then she had the same ethics and the same way she cared about her clients and how concerned she was about them. And this was the same way that I was inherently. That's how we did our business. So that part was natural. The only thing I had to teach Colette was organization. And because she, she did never even used a paper clip. It was my first gift to her was a box of paper clips. <laughs> and I am not kidding because I give organization a definition, talk about neurotic. And there's this person that's coming in with the papers all over the folder, and I'm like, ah! so, so we had some long lessons on organization, every single document. And we don't have, a, I know administrator, for many of you, there's nothing better than having an um, administrative assistant. But I can't work that way. I'm like you are. I have to have control of every piece of paper. And let me tell you, she's a genius at it. There's nothing in the file that's out of order. That was the only thing I had to teach her was organization. The rest of it was natural. It was inherent. A word of advice for you? Get over it. <laughs> yeah. You, you, yeah. Can't, you can't have control of everything. No, and, the, and the reality is, is you're not the best at everything either. And I'm a huge contestant of that because I was the same way. And I used to think that I always had to have power until I found somebody better. And now I'm like, how do I give them everything that I do? <laughs> yep. And so. It's, it's really hard to do, but as soon as you can get over that, you're going to go from here to here yeah. in yeah, a heartbeat. Right. So I'm just... Uh, they're, they're, just like we want to develop a trust with our clients, developing a trust within your team or your partners, it, it, it can be tough. You know, I was the same way. I mean, I was doing all my REO business for a while. The, I had a team of nine, ten people. No one was allowed to talk to the client. The only person that could talk, physically talk to the client was me. People were sending emails that were masquerading as me, but no one could physically talk to the client. It took me years to the point where I could sit back and say, okay, you know, Debbie or David or Drew, take those calls, deal with that client. And frankly, <coughs> when you develop that trust and you have the right team members in place, which is difficult. Um, I don't know that everybody on the panel, specifically Carlos and Chris, would say they just fell in love with the Colette, just like that, and the mic. It's, it's, it's tough getting that chemistry and having that, you know, hey, I'm Sicilian, you're Sicilian, we understand each other type of relationship. But if you are truly, if your goal and your business plan is to grow to a certain level, you're going to have to bring in some, um, some partners. Um, you, you can do 20, maybe 25 transactions a year kind of on your own with an with a assistant type administrator, but if you want to do 40 or 140, um, that's a different, whole different level of business. So, um, um, okay, so keep the questions coming. Let, let me throw this at you. Um, I want to get back to um, the listing presentation, okay? Let's start with Carlos and work our way down the road here. And we've had a couple of listings, so we're going to bring Fred in here for a second and see how he's done this. But I'm curious... The style, the time, the presentation, is there an order? Is it from the hip? Um, what, are, what are we doing on a listing presentation? Um, Mine's more from the hip, for sure. Um, I, really? I get a lot, of, yeah, it's, it's weird. I was listening to you, and like, I get a lot of clients who call me from Yelp and Zilla who want to list with me before they even know me. So it's very easy. Come list appointments. Come list, yeah. Yep. Just come sign the come listing. List me. I can just email them the listing contract, they, they sign it, and away we go, pretty much. Um, and you would attribute I that get, to, wh why do they have a trust with you when they don't know you? Well, wh how I get, is, a, how a, big, is that I get a big percentage of listings from uh, referrals, which those are, again, very easy. They already think, feel like they know you from the, their friends who told them about you and their experiences with you. Uh, and then the, the uh, people who call me from, like I said, Yelp and Zillow. I mean, I have 70, over, almost 80 reviews now on Zillow and Trulia, and 35 on Yelp. So people read through those reviews, and they feel like they already know your, what you're going to do for them before you even open your mouth. Right. So it's, it, that's kind of what has been made, made it fairly easy for me. 
I think maybe two out of every 10 listing appointments I go on, I'm actually competing against other agents. Right. And so in that case, then yes, I have to give them the 30 minute spiel about all the stuff that I offer, my marketing, advertising campaigns, uh, my records as, as far as selling properties for top dollar and in, in the shorter periods of times. And that's, you know, once I give them all that information, and I try and keep it short. She's saying like four, three or four hours for a listing presentation. I, no, my, no, there's a difference. Is it for that, preparation? No, it's what I, I'm doing mm -hmm. is when we get to the part where we're doing all the disclosures and the contracts. That's different from. Okay, so your actual listing presentation where you're in oh, front of them to. That's different. Totally. Okay, that's it's, what I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I maybe like, I wow. need to like, clarify <laughs> that. Well, we'll have time to clarify. I, so, I have ADHD, so, so yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, you know, I, I kind of put myself in that position. Like, I, I feel like I have 30 minutes to connect with that client. Oh, yeah. No, you couldn't do two to four hours. That, for, that's a different, yeah. different thing. Yeah. So. Okay, so, but on, so on those appointments, so you're getting, there's a difference between a listing appointment and a come list me appointment. You know, a listing appointment is, okay, I've got an appointment. I don't really know Chuck very well, but I'm going out there. I'm going to try to develop that. That might take an hour, it might take three or four hours. It's a different presentation as opposed to a come list me because I've seen you on Yelp with yeah. your reviews and your five stars. I've seen you on Zillow with 70 reviews and they five go, stars. They can see the list of all the houses you've sold. Right, which, you which gets to me, gets so. back to that 595. You know, 5% of the agents, 95% of the business. If you, if you go to Zillow, um, we can have a whole Zillow conversation today and you look at the agents that are getting traction on Zillow, 100% or 99% of those agents, they have traction because they have a lot of reviews and they have quality reviews. And it's the same thing that you and I do when, assuming you do what I do, you know, I, wanna, I wanna go to Cabo next summer and I'm not really sure where I wanna stay, I wanna try something different, so I go on Travelocity and, and man, I search by, I don't want to see anything less than four stars. Right. I don't even want to see it. And I don't know anything about these hotels. But all I, and I may not even read the reviews, to be honest with you. I'm not, I'm not one of those people who writes reviews, and I'm not necessarily one that reads reviews. But I tell you one thing I don't want to see, I don't want to see anything with less than four stars. And I think the consumer's doing the exact same thing with their agents. Mm -hmm. And when you have one five star rating, I don't know about that either. So that's why you mentioned about Yelp. I mean, before you start paying for Yelp, you should probably kind of try and build up at least a double digit review rating before you start paying for Yelp. So work on maybe getting 10 reviews and then you can start. And those are really easy to get, it. right? It's really easy to get people to give you reviews. No, Yelp is very difficult because they have their own software. They kind of like uh, uh, filters reviews like I have 35 reviews on Yelp and I have another 25 from legitimate clients that they wouldn't that they won't up. display right so I literally I could have yeah 60 reviews on Yelp and that would like be by far not even close to the second place person oh. but at 35 I'm still probably uh, double what the next person is in Redlands and so that I, again from that that alone I just get basically automatic clients right on, on Yelp, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to Carlos as our Yelp expert. No, My experience expert, <laughs> with realtors using Yelp, uh -huh. there's a handful, there's an extremely small percentage of eight active agents in the business today that are using it, Yelp. It takes time, too. I started three or four years ago on that to try and get up to 35. Right. So it, it doesn't happen overnight. Okay, back to the, so your listing, a lot of, it sounds like a lot of your listing presentations are what we all would aspire to, which are the come list me calls. I mean, yeah. by, and, and frankly, I would assume, and Charlene probably, past That's clients, all. they're yeah. all come list me calls. The, the, what I was talking about earlier this morning is what we do after, but 99% of our business is all referral business, and people call and basically say, please come and list our house. Yep. So I'm not spending two to four hours <laughs> at, at that But time. you've already got the business. Yeah, so the business yeah. is there. But it's all the other things we do that at some point in time we'll talk about that I think is, it isn't technology. 
It's, it's well, let's, let's talk about the commission then. Because, okay. okay, so you get a come list me call. Okay. And they say, All let, right, let, so me set it, let me set it up for you. So you get a call and says, hey, Charlene, I've. Colette. Or Colette, or whatever it happens to be. I've been here for a while and I'm thinking about selling and we're going to do this business. And, and the I first thing we ask them, who referred us? Okay. And that's very important because we put that on the file. Right. And they're probably polite. They're probably not saying, oh, by the way, I don't want to list for more than four and a half percent. Oh, nobody. So, would so you're no, coming no. out at that point. You're then spending two hours, three hours, however long it takes. That's right. At some point, putting a listing agreement in front of them that says. Then we then and we'll, we'll, we'll be at their house two, three different times. And we check. We take notes when we go out there. We go through every room. They talk about all the things they've done. We spend lots of time. We might go out again. They want us to talk about this. What needs to be repaired? What needs to be done? Who needs to do this? Do we do the termite work now? Do we do it later? And all of the stuff we're working on and working on, and then we'll come, we'll say, you know what? We probably should get the listing, we call it. We do the paperwork. We never say a contract. We say do the paperwork. So we, then we have them come into the office, and that's when I was talking about the amount of time, Carlos. That's, that's when we sit down with every single document. Yeah, the stack. The stack. You know what that stack looks like. So yep. everything is done. So once we put that property on the market and we sell it, we hand that package to the buyer's agent right then, not a week later. To, you know how many times the disclosures dribble in when you're trying to do a contract? We don't have any of that because we have our package all ready to go. And of course, by doing all of that ahead of time, we're learning about the property. When we do the flyer, we understand the upgrades so that we could, we could market it properly. We have the photo shoot, so we get everything ready to go so we're taking care of those people. That's when we were talking about by the time we're done doing all of this, nobody cares about what they're paying us because whatever we want, they'll pay us. They don't care. Most of the times, we'll say, oh, you know, we don't, it, it's, never, it's never brought up as an issue because they're already overwhelmed by how much work they have seen us do, and we haven't even started yet because we haven't even put the property on the market. So and commission is very rarely even brought up in your discussions? They're almost never brought up. We could fill in whatever we want and it would be. Question? Yeah, I have a question. Oh. Um, we're talking from the perspective of um, agents that are pretty established and have um, you know, already built their book of business. Right. When you first started, what sort of prospecting activities do you have to do to build that book of business? Okay, I'll answer. It's nothing different than what I do today and that's the whole point I wanted to make today. When I started in the business, we didn't have a desktop, laptop, iPhones, iWatches, uh, you know, Zillow, Trillo, Milo, whatever. We had nothing. So we were hands-on with our buyers and our sellers all the time. Everything, we had a little book. and Where'd you get them, though? Where'd they come from? Well, basically, they came from signs. Sign calls? Sign calls. How'd you get your sign in the ground? Sorry. Well, if somebody had, well, you went. <laughs> it starts somewhere. Somewhere. No, you're absolutely right, but somebody in the office was because we had a huge office, like 35 people. There were a lot of successful people. Let's say when I came in the office. Okay, but there, was, there were generic signs. Nobody had their name on a sign. It was Coal Banker, and you took up time. You, they rotated you 9 to 12, 12 to 4, 4 to 8. You were on that phone answering phone calls. So you took a phone call, and that's how you got your buyer. So when the buyer came in, you took them. To, they had their little book. We had a book that came out once a week, one paragraph of what your listing, where the listings were. And you went through the book, and then you took your buyer out. If you worked with the seller, you did everything you could with the seller. You had to present your offer personally to the listing agent when you wrote the offer. So when you're complaining about your email taking time to get over to the agent when you have an offer, just think about having to make an appointment and go to the seller's house or to the office to present your offer. And if that one didn't work, you got to do that maybe two or three more times until an offer worked. We if have you were the listing agent, you did that also. Okay, so that's how you started your business. And then you, when you were done with that business, you cultivated that client. That was the most important person. You did exactly what Lance was talking about. You put them on a database. Anybody you met when you did an open house, we had mm -hmm. open houses every Sunday. For three years, I did open house every week. Everybody you met, you send a thank you note to them, you wrote it out, you put them on your database. So you kept 
always this clientele with your buyers. When we closed an escrow, we bought them a little gift. At Christmas time, we wrote them cards, handwritten cards. We had to handwrite the addresses even. So we kept in constant, and we brought them candies. We bought the little kids candies. <laughs> Those little kids are all grown up three, 30 years later, and they're still calling me to sell their houses to them. Okay, so that stuff works great it's Af after. No, I've got the works, client, but, I'm doing but, the follow-up. But, 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 but a lot of the from things... From the beginning, from the beginning it starts. Yep. You, you, I had a prospect list from the beginning. It was handwritten. Everybody that you met, you prospect put on that list. list. And you kept in contact with them. It doesn't but, end, and well, they refer you. I don't think the follow-up is any different today than it was 100 years ago. That's right. You know, we run into somebody at a gas station. We run into somebody at a softball team. We run into somebody at the bar. At the church. You know, this is where the sales, right. this is where you're, you're never off, and you're always on. Okay. I'm, I'm walking through the lobby. Maybe I've got my Cobalt Banker thing in. I bump into somebody while I'm buying a cup of coffee. And you have to make a conscious decision. Am I on or am I off? And if you're off, which a lot of the times we are, I'm off. I don't want to bother this person while I'm standing in line at, at the supermarket. Well, if you're on, well, you are going to professionally bother that person while you're standing in line at the supermarket. But it is a lot different. We don't have generic signs anymore. Sign calls themselves have just gone. Even if you have your name on a sign, and even if it is personalized and it says, you know, I'm Realtor Fred with Fred's cell, special cell phone number. The sign calls today are almost non-existent because yeah. people aren't using the signs yeah, as much. Right. Now, cultivating the clients is, is, is one thing, and I don't think that that changes a whole lot, although I think we could sit back and say there's, there's some different methods to cultivate them, although I still love the holiday cards around the holiday season, and I love, you know, cookies on Easter, and I love pumpkins on Halloween and all the rest of that sort of stuff. But getting that new business, which I really think is the question, where am I getting? Yeah. I'm going to turn to Fred because Fred's one of the newer guys on the panel and give him an opportunity to do this. And, and, and again, you're, you're brand new in this. However, you also came from, what's your background? Before? Sales. Sales background. And in a marketing printing company? Yes. Uh, okay. So sign company. Sign, sign company. Okay. So you've been doing this for a little less than a year. Yes. Where have you been going to... Um, pick up these these phantom clients out there that we're all trying to grab. You don't have it. You don't have what a lot of the established agents have. You don't have 30 years of past clients, which is what we all strive for. So where are you picking up the leads that you've been working with in the last six nine months? I've advertised on Zillow. Zillow, brand new agent. If you don't mind me asking, how much money are you spending on Zillow? Now it's thousand a month. How much? Brand new. Ooh, did you hear that? A brand new agent. You think he has a business plan? Yes. You think he has a budget? Yes. Is he running this like a business? Okay, and he's just got a sales background. Thousand dollars a month on Zillow. Okay. Anything else, or is that you got all your eggs in that basket? Advertising. Uh, uh, I think my message is not right because it's not working. Okay, so we might need to adjust something <clears throat> so a little bit. So that's just giving you a little bit of... He didn't want us to advertise that. So the, oh, no, no. unless you have the right message, it doesn't work. But uh, I am working on the better message for print ads. You won't know the wrong message unless you try. Exactly. Right. Okay, so on the $1,000 a month on Zillow, um, you gave that some thought. Your, your business plan, and, and if I'm asking too much, just don't answer. But you're looking at a, a, a medium price above 500 -ish. 500 that's Okay, right. and you're targeting Anaheim, An Anaheim Hills. Um, and he's buying a specific section of a zip code. Okay, so those leads that are coming in through that type of marketing, what are you, what, what sort of success or, or lack thereof? Is there a, me when you say there's a messaging problem, is there a messaging problem on the Zillow ad, which is kind of tough to control, the messaging no, problem. Uh, on the print ad. On and the print ad. The, uh, the postcards uh, are not producing return calls. How much money are you spending on postcards? I spent uh, 1,200 get them developed, and then every time they mail out 1,000, it's $280. Okay, and you're doing once a month or? 
It's been once a month, but after uh, four months, I stopped it because it wasn't producing results. Okay. So I'm changing the postcard, and I want to continue with that. Got it. Um, so how's Zillow working for you? Zillow has paid for itself. Pardon I me? Mean, it's not great <laughs> because out of 30 calls that I get, maybe one or two are qualified uh, people that I can go out and work with. But, okay, uh, so 30 I've, calls, one or two. So by my quick calculation, somewhere between 3 and 5 or 6%. Of those yeah, leads. I've sold two out of uh, those calls, so that paid for itself. Okay. We have a question back here. Sorry, it's me again. <laughs> uh, yeah, question about that Zillow program that you signed up for. Uh, did you sign, you, you, you mentioned that you started putting 100% of the time into real estate since May? No. Is that when you started the Zillow campaign? I started uh, Zillow actually earlier. Before I started working on the business plan, I started Zillow Advertising, about a, about maybe simultaneous, a few weeks before. And uh, so I've been advertising on Zillow about uh, seven months. And uh, uh, I have five, uh, five big ones, reviews. <laughs> Five reviews? Five, five reviews. reviews. Don't, don't laugh at that. Five reviews. Start so I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because <laughs> I already know the answer. There are a lot of people in, in this room that have been in this business a lot longer than seven months that don't have any reviews um, on Zillow. We have another so. question. I'm just wondering what you think your net return is on the investment for the last seven months with Zillow, just what, what you think the return is on that. Before you answer, just because I do a lot on Zillow as well, the $1,000 spend is so different for everybody in all of our different markets. He's in Anaheim, uh, the higher sale price, yeah. depending on where you guys are at, the, you could spend less money and probably get more of that zip code, just to, to let you guys know. But Yeah, Zillow, Zillow is quite an interesting um, business model as it relates to what they charge and the zip codes and the value. I mean, literally, the higher the sales price, the higher the buy, add buy. Oh, um, yeah, that's exactly small. right because uh, Anaheim, it's costing thousand nine hundred twelve dollars, but uh, Anaheim Hills would be eighteen hundred for less number of leads. So the price uh, er area price makes a difference on uh, price of advertising. But to answer your question, uh, so seven months, it's about. Seven thousand dollars, but two sales—that's eighteen thousand dollars in commission. Uh, one more question okay. so, about. Well, but before we go past that, on, on the other question, okay, this is a really, really simple concept, okay, and, but it's, it can be a little tough. And you sit back and say, "Oh my God, and it was a thousand bucks a month, or even a hundred dollars a month, um, depending upon where you are." But at the end of the day, everything—and by the way, I'm going to put this in the form of a question to you guys here in a minute. Everything that I think we should be doing, you need to be able to measure, okay? So if I'm going to spend $1,000 or if I'm going to spend two hours or if I'm going to spend, you've got, that kind of gets back to that stop, start, continue. If, if I, I generally don't suggest you do anything in your business plan, especially spend money, unless you can measure it, unless when you go into it, you know it's something you cannot measure and you're only doing it your only reason you're doing it is because you feel there's value to the brand. So I'm going to spend this amount of money. I, it's going to be impossible for me to figure out how many sales will come out of it, but I see value in branding. But seven months, seven grand, two sales, 18 grand, it's paid for itself. And I think the question over there is what was the, what was the return on investment? Well, the return on investment on that is 140% or whatever the heck it happens to be. Um, which is why the math is so important. There's a slide which we're going to, we actually, we may just, you know, shit can the rest of this presentation and do this for the rest of the day. But there's a slide in here later on in the presentation which talks about the math is important, okay? And the math really is important. I mean, if you're going to spend that amount of money, you've got to be able to sit back and measure it. And then when you can say, I spent seven and I returned 18, that's kind of a no-brainer. Well, um, another thing I was actually going to mention while I was up here is 
double, triple down on your strengths. He might be really good on the phone, taking Zillow leads. You might not be. Don't expect that same 140% return no matter how much you're spending. Or vice versa. Or vice versa, exactly. You might be way better. So just to hear our numbers, and we're all, I know the guys that are doing Zillow are you know, making money on it, that doesn't mean you will be. Um, and you could be three times what we are. So I, I say that to everybody. If your strengths are holding open houses, then hold 12 of them a month. If your strengths being on the phone, then sit in a call center and take calls and hire somebody else to go out on those appointments. Triple down on what you're good at. If you're good in front of the camera, maybe you should do that. If okay, you're writing blog posts. Hold the question for just a second. I don't want to get away from this topic because I think it's important. Um, and it's frankly, it's a it's it's a topic that's kind of painful for for me as a broker owner because many of the agents in the office, not so much the folks here, but many of the agents in the office, are look to ownership and management as a source of leads. And when they're not getting leads from the company, it's like, well, there's something wrong here. I'm not getting enough leads from the company. Maybe I'll go join a team because Fred now has more leads than he knows what to do with. Or maybe I'll go to the ABC company because they, they're promising me leads. So not to minimize um, you know, where the source of the leads are, who's paying for the leads, where those leads are coming from. But let me give you a little, a, a little secret here, and this is painful. Okay, we promised we were going to be honest with each other today. Um, Fred has five, I'm assuming, five-star reviews on Zillow. Yes. Okay. Um, and some leads in the pipeline and all the rest of that. Carlos has 70? 80. 80. Yeah. Five-star reviews on mm -hmm. Zillow. Carlos's return on investment, hands down, is going to be better than Fred's. Just, that's just the way it is. You got the five, you got the 70. So when we come into this thing cold and we go into Zillow and say, well, geez, okay, I got to spend money on Zillow, and you have zero reviews, okay? Quite honestly, you could probably spend $1,000 a month and have zero reviews and almost get nothing um, out of that. You're going to get some stuff just organically. But when you build it up to the point where you've got, and by the way, don't sneeze at five, because five's going to turn into six, and that's going to turn into 20 before you know it. Um, but when you get to the level, how many did you, how many did you read? 60. 60, 70. Okay, well, there's no coincidence that these guys are, you know, top dog when it comes to that sort of stuff. But that's, again, not easy. Not easy getting those, getting, the, getting, those, um, getting those leads. Okay, let's, let's go back to the, uh, there was a question I, I squashed. Um, did we lose it? Yeah, just so yell. Who? Fred? Fred. Generally, Zillow is six, six months. months. Six months. So I, I renewed it, yes. After six months, I renewed it. But after six months, you don't have to do another six months because it's basically month to month. The first uh, six months, they want to make sure you, you advertise enough, long enough to, to understand how it works. That's why they give you that six months. After that, it's month to month. So for you, using my stop, start, continue, obviously you're on month seven. So you renewed, so that was a continue. Yes. So have, have, is anybody, and again, more specific, because I know you're not on Zillow right now, Shirley. So you, you, you've been, you probably modified your, your Zillow buy, but. I've been, I've been adding, adding, adding more to my budget. I, I'm up to about 2300 a month in Zillow, on Zillow. Adding. On three different uh, zip codes. So obviously it's not working for you. <laughs> I shoot for a 10 to 1 return normally on my advertising dollars. Did you hear that? 10 to 1. 10 to so. 1. So if I'm doing the math right, Carlos is going to spend I, what I, is that thirty grand approximately on Zillow? All together with all my budgets is around three thousand a month for for all my advertising, twenty three hundred a month for Zillow and Trulia. Okay, so so, so if that's not going to return three fifty for you, then then you it's considered a failure. Right. Yeah. But if it returned two eighty, you probably would still. I'm average. still okay with that. <laughs> right. Okay. We have How many question? have you closed off of Zillow this year? You know what? I have on my database. I have roughly. Um, gosh, I don't know. I'd have to look back. I, I just reviewed the numbers with my Zillow rep, Five? too. Probably about 
six, seven, eight, something like that, 10 maybe. I pay 600 a month and Stacy's closed six for me. You so know what I, it is I spend too? far less than these gentlemen. Also, Zillow and Trulia though, they don't, these, a lot of times they don't pay off right away. Yep. A lot of times I get, Zillow, I get Zillow and Trulia people in my database that call me back a year later, yep. two years later, yep. and they're doing, and then that's when the transaction yep. occurs. Hold that question just a second. I want to piggyback on what Carlos just said. Um, Drake and Drew and I were at a conference, a couple of anchor things um, in Vegas. It wasn't part of the Gem Blue, but it was part of a business planning deal that I do. So I remember earlier I said twice a year, kind of lock yourself away and review your business plan. Well, I practice what I preach. I, twice a year, I go with a group of people actually, and a big part of what we do is review the business plan. Having said that, we had a Skype call from a team in Fargo, North Dakota. I don't even know what the median sales price is in Fargo, but I think it's probably less than what we're dealing with in Southern California, all right? There, 220? Oh, I was gonna say less than that. But at any rate, Fargo, North Dakota. They do a tremendous amount of online lead gen. Their average, average incubation time for a lead, anybody wanna take a shot? Two years, nine months? 18 months. 18 months, yeah. okay? Which is painful for a lot of us in this room, and it's painful for us as broker managers on to the degree that we are passing some leads out to everybody because we all tend to want instant gratification. Okay, and if you're gonna spend that much money, whatever it is, three grand, 600, you know, 1,000 bucks a month, whatever it is, if you're gonna spend that much money on lead gen, and if the expectation is, if they don't buy a house this week, I'm done with them, you're leaving a huge <laughs> amount of money, I mean a huge amount of money on the table. No. Because that follow-up, 18 months, you're going to call somebody randomly called you today looking for information on a sign call. They gave you no indication that they were ready to do anything today or even next week. And, I, and you're telling me that I got to follow up with them for 18 months? Yes, that's what I'm telling you, um, which is why you've got to have some sort of automated contact uh, management and follow-up system. Otherwise, a huge percentage of this money that these folks are, and I would suggest, quite honestly, they're wasting money. Not on what they're spending. There are leads that are not getting followed up on. Are there any, do you guys follow up 100% every single time? I do email blasts. I, yeah, I have stuff that's automated, but it's not, you know, it's, I, that automated stuff gets sent out and they reply back, then I will personally call them or talk. But I, I would assume that all of you are constantly trying to refine that. Make sure the follow-up sure. is, is better, yeah. um, well, more received, adjust your message, something maybe is wrong with your print message. And Zillow actually sends you a report card every month and tells you how you've done. So you're Did doing. you follow up on time? Did you not? With the team right. in place too, it's been Question. Amazing. Oh, what you got? Yeah, I do a lot of, um, face-to-face -face door knocking, but I haven't heard much of that. Uh, do any of you, have you tried that? Um, how often do you um, approach the people? And um, I can't think of the other question. Uh, what do you do about, um, like one area I tried in Covina, um, I got over and over again, people said they get five or six Realtors every week. Real, real tours. Real, real tours. tours. <laughs> not, not real. No, sorry. Every week. Real, real tours. Sorry about That's that. That's okay. It's my southern accent. I got it. Uh, we'll forgive you. How do you handle the uh, extreme competition? Do you just give up and move on? Okay, okay so let me recast that. Who's knocking doors and doing cold calls? Anybody? No uh, cold calls. No door knocking. Who's working fizzbos? Anybody? Not anymore. Expired not listings. Not anymore. Anybody? Well, I got something for you. I mean, have you, are you checking turnover rate in the area? Sorry. Are you checking turnover rate in that neighborhood that you're, the doors that you're knocking? Have you looked at the turnover rate? How many houses are selling? Uh, yeah, all the time. Right, what's, what's the turnover rate that you're hitting? I mean, your target should be 6% or more. If, if the turnover rate is not 6% or greater, you get out of there anyway, just to start. And that stuff's relatively easy to figure out. You know, for any of you that have sat through like a farming class, what Chris is referring to is before you're going to go into a neighborhood and knock doors or before you're going to go into an area and call people, let's do some research. Who watches Gold Rush? Anybody watch Gold Rush? Okay, for the two people here that watch Gold Rush, okay, before, 
they go <laughs> gold mining, okay, and they're going to go mine on this big mountain. They go, they drill some test holes, right? And they sit back and say, ah, there's some gold here. And then they go spend all their time, effort, and money. It's the same thing with, with real estate. If we're going to spend hours and hours and hours prospecting on the phone or hours and hours and hours cold door knocking or months and months and years going into a farm, well, let's drill some test holes first. Let's go in. Let's find the data. What is the turnover rate? We're, I live in Canyon Crest and Riverside. During between 2007 and 2000, excuse me, between 19, no, 2007 and 2015, let's just say that seven, eight year period, the turnover rate where I lived was close to zero. And you know how hard that was to find that out? Not hard at all. Anybody with a little bit of computer savvy and a couple of, could have figured, out, figured it out within, yeah, you know, Annette could have told you if you didn't know how to do it. You could have figured that out in a matter of minutes. And guess how many people cold called and door knocked and farmed in Canyon Crest during that window? A lot. All they had to do was move about a mile to the south and move into Mission Grove, an orange crest, okay? And the turnover rate in those neighborhoods was well above 6%. So you gotta, you gotta be smart, but I do find, actually I don't find it interesting at all. No cold calling, no door knocking cold, no expireds. Tr let's, let's go back to traditional old school marketing. Open houses. Open, open okay. houses. Yeah. We're doing open houses work. Yes. Oh, that's how I did all my business. Um, how often? How, huh? every week, How often? Every weekend? Every week for three years, every single Sunday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah, and do you hold it or do your other, your teammates Tuesday. hold it? I hold my own. You hold your own or a teammate? Oh, no. I had no team in those early days. The first, the first 15 years, I was by myself. Same thing. In my early years, I held all of yeah. mine. Now I have a team in place. And everybody I met at that open house, I put them on a database immediately. I called them prospects. Yep. Right. And I never lost contact. You're talking about 16 months. I had people calling me 10 years later because I kept yep. in contact with them, wrote them personal little cards. I know you think that's silly. No. Nope. But handwritten, Don't think it's silly. handwritten cards, generic cards, whatever. Keep in contact with everybody that you meet. I would get, I couldn't even remember after some of those. I'm thinking, how? I, they'd say, oh, yes, we met you on an open house, and you were so nice, and you were so helpful, even though we had another agent. Uh, but, and you knew that, and you didn't care, and you were just still trying to assist us. And we bought from that agent, and they're no longer in business. They've retired, and we'd like you to list our house 10 years yep. later. So when he's telling you not to give up, he's not kidding. Don't give up. That's your database. Everybody you run across, keep on up. We call it a database. You call it contact management. Whatever Same it is, thing. Same don't thing. lose contact with anybody. The, be the best part now, that person that comes back 10 years later, you can Facebook stalk them and find out what they're into and what they like. And then when you call them, it's not so much of a disconnect anymore. Yep. It'll never be a oh, disconnect. Oh, you're at the baseball game. I was at the if baseball game. If you're talking game. to somebody, yep. That's the most important thing is that interpersonal the reaction. face to face I think is uh, very key to getting you that in, your foot in the door. So it's, uh, it's good. Yeah. Okay, so open houses are still working. And by the way, generally speaking, open houses are almost free. Basically free. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I do have an exception to open houses. Okay. You need to know where you're open housing. I've had people ask me to open house my listings and, they're, and I only let them do them if they're vacant. And then so I'll say to them, okay, I say, did you see, have you seen the listing? No. Um, do you know anything about the condominium complex or the neighborhood or whatever it is? Uh, no. Uh, do you know what the dues, you know? <laughs> do you no. know anything? Do you know anything? That's <laughs> so right. do your so, homework, right? So, right? And you know what I say to them? I say, those people that are going to come into that open house are going to be asking you questions, right. either about the neighborhood, what's sold, Schools. about the condominium complex. The seller might come in. The seller doesn't live there, but they might come in to see, you know, even though you tell your seller somebody else is doing your open house. But those are your potential buyers and sellers. They're right in front of you. Yep. You don't have to do Zillow or, or Yelp or whatever you want to do. You can do that. But don't forget, those are the people right in front of you. They're eventually going to buy or sell. That's why they're coming into the, your yep. open house. If you don't know anything about what you're open housing, you're going to lose them as your market base. Who's, who's gone, to, and forget about real estate for a minute, who's gone to a car dealer? or to a 
some sort of a display area where there's a sale involved and there's a salesperson involved and maybe they kind of say, okay, hey Chuck, yeah, you're interested and, and you even volunteer your information. I do this all the time, okay? I'm a sales guy. I like, and I can be, I'm the easiest one in the world to sell. So here's my card. I recently, if you follow me on Facebook, you know I recently bought, um, Julie got a new car, okay? So we went for, and then we kind of had fun with this. Normally we're very spontaneous buyers when we buy a car, we know what we want, and we just go and we do it, okay? But matter of fact, Carlos and I went back and forth when I was at the Porsche dealer, and he, Carlos was telling me all about the right Porsche that I needed to, to, to purchase for Julie. So I'm literally telling people, I'm going to buy a car. I'm not going to buy it tonight, but I'm going to buy a car. Here's my car. Here's my information. Broker, owner, Cobalt Banker, yada, yada, yada. Okay? And I went to every single luxury dealer that you could think of, whether it was Porsche or Lexus or Mercedes, BMW. I went to all of them. But we didn't buy in that first... Are you cold, Charlie? <laughs> we want to pass it out up here. Uh, this is it's why cold. everybody loves Paul. <laughs> oh. So... At any rate, we went to every single one of these dealers, and I told all of them, I we're going too. to buy a car, but we're not going to buy a car today. And I'm not sure whether it's going to be an Infiniti or whether it's going to be a Mercedes. I don't know what it's going to be. We passed out at least six or seven cards. I had two salespe two salespeople call me more than once. And after day three, zero. Nobody called me back. That's right. And I just, I just like, wow. Yeah. I'm telling these people. I'm literally saying, Andre, I'm going to buy a house. I'm not buying it today, but I'm going to buy a house. I'm not sure whether it's going to be in, in Ontario or whether it's going to be in Pomona or it's going to be in Upland, but I'm going to buy a house. Here's my card. And I do that seven, eight, nine times. Two people call me back, one or two call me back more than two or three times, and they give up after four days. That, I think, is really the crux of our problem, whether it's contact management or database or whatever the heck you want to call it. Okay, I want to ask a couple more questions, and then I... I have a question. Oh, oh, Andre, I'm sorry. Yep, Andre with the mic. Yes. How many, um, speaking of the database management, how many different types of database management programs did you go through before you found the one that you're currently using, and what are you using? Great question. I love, that's my favorite question. You guys Carlos, what are, you, what are you using? I went through two. I started out with, uh, I think it was Top Producer, yep. the other one. And it had way too many functions for me. I couldn't really figure it out and get comfortable with it. So uh, one of my lenders introduced me to the big purple dot, and I started using that, and it just, very simple to use, and uh, it's been very effective for me. So big purple dot. In case you didn't, yeah. that's the name of it. Nobody has simple names anymore. So they're in big Irvine. purple dot. They're kind of in Irvine, and it, it's worked really well. Yeah. Okay. And how often are you in it? Every day, pretty Every much. Every day. Yeah. All right. Every day. Charlene, what do you got? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Lee, let what do you go got? For I think I filtered through two. Contactually, I think, was my first one. And then I went to Top Producer for a little while. I'm just making a change right now. Um, what is it? Lion Desk is who I'm using right now. Uh, but the real answer to that is it doesn't matter which one. The best one to use is the one that you use. I think that's Lance's line. It doesn't matter what you have. Just use one of them. You can use postcard. You can use 3 by 5 index cards in a file cabinet. <laughs> it's not what I would use. But if that's what you have, and that is a system that says, okay, I'm going to call these seven people today. That'll work. Well, Your, I top producer? I agree with Carlos, though, as opposed to you, because it does matter what you use, because, like he was saying, sometimes it may have too many functions and you end up not using them. So that one's they, but this is the deal. I, this, this, you're, you're in my wheelhouse right now, okay? They all have too many functions. It's true. Okay? All of the programs out there have so many things Generally speaking, you would never use all of them. You, as long as it's, you're comfortable with it, it's easy for you and your team to use. You're in it daily, if not hourly, if not minutely. Um, use the features that you're comfortable with. Now, if you're tinkering, who's using Realty Juggler right now? Only a couple of you? Okay. Um, Realty Juggler, a lot of folks have used. It's, it's a good program. Is it the best? No. 
uh, I'm not familiar. I'm familiar only through Carlos. Mine also has an app now on, on my iPhone, so ah. I can access it on my iPhone. So if, it, I well, love it. It's if so you don't, great. I'm going to give you a little of my personal history after we finish up with these folks. But if your CRM, contact management, isn't completely mobile, you're in the wrong CRM. Okay, it's, you're in the wrong, and it needs to be. It needs to be on your iPhone. It needs to be anywhere you are in whatever fashion you're using it, whether it's a desktop, an iPad, a cell phone, um, you need to be able to have access to that. But I gotta tell you, a contact management program, in my opinion, is kind of like a marriage, okay? You're either in or you're out. It, it's, not a, it's not like, a, ah, I think I'll be married today. My wife didn't, wouldn't go for that, okay? You know, you're, you, you are committed to this or you're not. And I made a huge mistake, huge mistake. Okay, I was with the same, I'm just literally changing my contact management program like now. We started a month or so ago and we're in the process. The huge mistake that I made, and, I, and I'm gonna apply this to everything in my business, everything in my business, is I, I, will, I, I promise I will never do this again. I will never stay with any particular program because it's too painful to leave again. I was in a program called Goldmine, which is a very, very good program. But it was a 1995 program, and I need a 2000, I don't even want a 2017 program, I want a 2030 program. I want to have, we all, and this is another reason why I think this 95-5 rule is, is, gonna, is gonna kick in. We all have to have the best, absolute best tools at our disposal, or we are going to get run over, okay? Part of those tools, in my opinion, is a contact management program, and it has to be this, the best program out there within your budget, within what you can afford. Um, but without that, and I stayed in my program for 10 years longer than I should have, 10 years longer than I should have, because it was so painful for me to move. And now I'm moving, and all I can say is, why didn't I change into something? Because I am, a, I am, I've got 29 people in my CRM Every day, every day, and half of them are in there all day, every day. And if you're not in there all day, every day, you can't work for me. And for 10 years, I had at least one hand chained behind my back. So serums are super important. I, I know Carlos has been happy with the big purple dot, <coughs> purple yeah. dot, blue dot. Big purple dot. Purple yeah. dot. Okay, Chris was using um, Contactually, which by the way, Contactually is a very good program for any of those who are looking at that. It's a good program. Top producer, and are you still using Top Producer, Fred? Yes. Okay. I have Chris? a question. Chris? Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Who has a question? Right over here. Hold on a minute. Give me no, just a no second. Problem. Give me just a second. They've been using Top Producer. Um, top Producer's fine. I recommend Top Producer for darn near everybody in the room. But you've got to grab something, and it's got to be mobile. You've got to be able to have it on your phone. You've got to be able to access it everywhere. Um, pardon me? What are you changing? I'm changing a program called Zoho. Not prepared to endorse it at all. Come talk to me in four months. I might say, hey, for $30 a month, which is about what a lot of these other programs kind of sort of cost, it may be an option for you. Um, it's certainly working for me. What's your question? Uh, my question is for Chris. So um, I heard you say earlier that you were able to uh, spend like $600 into marketing and find some success in that. So my question is, how are you able to find such success compared to your peers in spending less like you did? Well, it goes back to the market. These guys are in higher markets than I am. My average sale price, 325 or so in the zip code that I advertise in. Um, so $600 probably goes further for me in my areas than their bigger spend in their areas. How many so. did you get from my? I'm in three zip codes too, so uh, my average spend is about maybe $800 per zip code. This so. goes back to taxes. It's not the same for, any, for everybody. It, it's gonna be different for everybody in your own zip codes, in your own area, in your own spend, and your own skill on the phone. So I don't, I don't think that my conversion rate's necessarily better than theirs. Um, my spend gets me a certain amount of impressions and it gets them a different amount of impressions. So tough to answer that. Yeah. It, Question. Yeah, if you, especially if you're thinking about going into that type of an ad buy, it, there's a lot of factors. Um, we certainly can talk about it more offline. But whatever it is, you gotta measure it. Because, I mean, Carlos is looking for 10 to one. 10 to one's like, man, god dang. If I could do 10 to one on everything I do, that's, that's a no brainer. Frankly, I'm, I'm not unhappy with Six, like two to one or two and a half to one. Spend seven, get 18. I gotta tell you, man, you know, if I, if I wouldn't be, I spend 100 grand, give me 200 grand back, I'd do that in Vegas all day long. I'd be curious to hear their, uh, their 
thoughts on this, but I don't think that it's just the Zillow pillar that does it for me. I do the tried and true where we're walking flyers door to door and then we're holding open houses in the same neighborhood and then there's Facebook targeted ads to the same neighborhood. So Zillow is probably not the first time they saw me. They see me everywhere and that's me and John. Yeah, and I don't know if we have enough time to get into the Facebook ads, but I think Facebook ads is a good place to take a look at. They're very inexpensive and you can get some pretty good impact. Yeah. Okay, quick question. For brand new agent, just came on, um, got my license in September. What is one thing that you recommend us to do? Because I feel like it's all about money. You got to advertise here. You got to spend money here. Notepads, door knocking. Um, I'm sorry, but me personally, I don't answer the door when they knock on my door. You know, I don't answer my phone when they call me. <laughs> I, I don't do none of that stuff. I, you, if you want to get a hold of me, leave a message and I'll call you back. That's just me. Yep. But what is one thing that you guys recommend me to do that's not going to you know, cost me so much money. Yep. Do you know what I mean? May I answer that first? Because uh, they might have much better answers, but my answer to that is uh, you need to get with Lance one-on-one -on -one and put together a business plan. And uh, that really will make a difference in your business. That gets you off to the right start. I'll answer the question with a question. Do you have any kids? I do. Your kids in any sports? My, with my kids, uh, I, I was actually talking to, um, over here to um, Charlene, and I, I asked specifically her, because to me, I feel like it's more personal, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm sorry, but when you come knocking on my door, I'm not going to just trust you to sell my home, or uh, you're not going to just trust me to, you know, buy something. So I feel like it's more of a one-on-one, -on -one, but I just don't feel like I got to be spending so much money. Well, it's not about the money. It has nothing on, on to do with the money. And there's okay. no one thing that I can tell you that this is as a brand new agent, this is what you need to go do. Okay. There is no one lead source that's going to make your business anything to even talk about. Yeah, right. He had the lead sources up there. There was mm -hmm. like 45 of them. You need to do like 20 of them. Okay. So to tell you any one thing to do, get involved with all your kids stuff, go to the mm -hmm. PTA, get involved with the county, get the community, uh, do open houses, okay. door knock, all that stuff's free. Okay. So, I mean, that was yep. eight things right there that you don't have to spend any money on. Okay. One of the things, if I, if I maybe made a mistake or if, if I might be sending the wrong message with this particular panel, um, let, me, let me back off of that because your question is a solid question because most of us, when I got into the business, I wasn't able to spend $1,000 a month. I wasn't able to spend $50 a month on certain marketing. Carlos, Charlene, and Chris, I'm going to separate Fred out here a little bit. They're taking, they're taking their business from this level to a different level, okay? Um, they're, they were at a, I don't even know what their closing was, but their income and their closings was here. They sat back through their own internal business plan and said, I want to go from here to this next step. Part of that next step was I want to take advantage of the marketing that's there and spend some money, whether it's Zillow or Yelp or whatever it happens to be or web pages or videos or whatever it happens to be. Now, this is where maybe I made the mistake by putting Fred on the panel and saying, here's a brand new agent who is extremely unusual in that brand new agents generally don't go in and start spending $1,000 a month on advertising. He's got a business plan. He's got, obviously, some resources and the ability to do that, OK? So this is the deal, though. Most of you don't have the ability to do that today. All, Chris just nailed all of those, those sphere of influences, OK? Or not sphere of influence, but all of those lead sources. You can go out there and, frankly, not spend a dime. If you just did pure shoe leather and hard work, oh, here I go. I'm going to step in it right now. Closing one house every other month is not hard. Closing six escrows a year is not hard. Spending almost no money. Now, I know I'm stepping in it because there's a lot of people in this room that don't do that. They haven't done those numbers, and they've been in it for longer than a year. That's why this whole business planning session, I think, is so important. Because I just said it's not hard. Well, come on, Lance. What do you mean it's not hard? I'm stuck. But this is the deal. It might take you a year to, to get to that point. Okay? It might take you two years to get to that point. But there's a lot of brand new agents in this business that just threw shoe leather. And I don't describe shoe leather as knocking on doors. I agree with you. Knocking on doors, that's, that's, old. that's so different. Okay? Um, cold calling, yeah, that's so different. But there's a smart way to knock on doors, and there's a smart way to cold call. In the old days, when we knocked on doors, we went into a neighborhood and said, this looks like a nice neighborhood. I think I'll start here. And I'll... 
go down and I'll go down. There was no thought put into it whatsoever. When we did cold calling, we got a list of phone numbers. We started on the top. We went all. That is the stupidest thing on the planet. Okay, that is a complete waste of resources and time. If you're going to knock on doors today, we got to be smart about it. What's the program that you're using? Um, top producer. No, not top producer. The other one. The, oh, um, the Haynes. No, Haynes. The other one. The target marketing. Uh, Robo, -gateway. Robo Gateway. Robo Gateway. Robo Gateway. Robo Gateway. Rebo. Okay. Rebo Gateway. Rebo Gateway. Rebo. Okay. There's a program called Rebo Gateway and others. Yes, there's some costs associated with that. But guess what? Haynes is free. We can talk more about that later. Where you can go in and you can say, I want to target this particular segment of the market. And these are the only people I'm going to call. It works, guys. But you know what? It's like going to the gym. Nobody wants to do it, right? We all know how to lose weight, right? You eat less and exercise. I've been trying to lose the same freaking 30 pounds for 10 years, for God's sakes, OK? Um, it's the same thing on real estate. There's nothing magical about this, but it is, there is some hard work associated with it. Okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to do one more closing question for these guys. By the way, this went exactly as I was hoping it would. Um, and then, but John, you got one first? I, I just wanted to touch on this for new agents. And uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the sales manager in Redlands. Uh, and many of you, if not most of you, attended my CBX classes. And you know I'm a huge, huge fan of CBX. Yep. And uh, to me, as a brand new agent, one of the best ways you can get out there and get your name out there, not cold calling on people, warm calling on people, call the people you know, your sphere of influence. And if you're a brand new agent, take advantage of that. Say, hey, my broker wants me to come out and practice my listing presentation. Can I make an appointment and come and practice my listing presentation with you? And you go out and you take your CBX and you've done a CMA for their property. And in some cases, they're going to say, wow, I didn't realize my property was worth that much. Honey, maybe we should think about selling now. And if you know the market and you know that next year we're going to have the highest prices ever in California yep. uh, since 2007, yeah, and you can talk about that, and this is a really good time to sell. In some cases, you're going to get that, and in some cases, you're going to get those people that say, wow, this CBX thing is so cool. I can't believe it. You really should show this to Sally down the street who wants to sell her house. Yep. And you take the next step. Nothing wrong say, with practicing on your friends and family. And I don't mean just fully practice. I mean practicing. If you've got more than a few people that you're friends with on Facebook, find out what their addresses are do CBX presentations and send it to them unsolicited. And depending upon who they are, you might even say, hey, I'm practicing. I'm new in the business. This is what my listing presentation looks at. Oh, by the way, I took the liberty to do it on your house and it's worth 710,000 bucks. You know anybody? I mean, there's a million things we can do. Last okay, one, 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 sorry. Oh, another one. Oh. This is for you, Chris, specifically. Because um, I've seen your, you know, your talk, you're going around town doing the restaurant, you know, that, platform. How is that working for you business-wise? Chris is doing videos, in case you didn't catch that from Elena. Chris has got this pretty nice concept, which he stole from somebody else, by the way. And he's basically <laughs> kind of doing restaurant reviews and promotion and co-branding and contacting owners of restaurants and saying, hey, I'm with a real estate company. Would you mind if I come in and kind of do like a, like a highlight piece on you, make a nice little video, and then he's just blasting it all over social media. It's Working. a long game. I mean, it's kind of doing some of what his magazine stuff's doing. It's brand awareness. It's, it's putting me out there as a brand. Um, I'm, I got plans. It's, it's long game. I'm going to leverage it a little later. Uh, but it gets me in there with the owners or the managers of whatever restaurant we're doing, any employees that are in there. A lot of people that are just sitting there having lunch or something, they're like, who are you and what's this about? So every time I go there, we talk about standing in line at a grocery store and maybe engaging with that person or not. Well, I'm at work. I'm suited up going down here to this restaurant to do the thing. I pass out like 20 business cards while I'm in there filming for two hours. So that's on the short term. It's getting me in front of people. It hasn't translated in any business just yet, but... But it will. it will. You can't have 27,000 views on a video and not turn it into something. Which Send Chris, is coming soon. Chris. Send Chris a friend request on Facebook. If you're not already, take a look at the stuff he's doing. Steal it. It's good. And I do think it's long game. I absolutely think it's long game. Okay, this is what I want to do. I want to go through the panel. One more, one more kind of question. 
Um, if you have something, like just an absolute failure, mistake, something that you did either a year ago or a week ago that you said, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that, and you want to share it, um, great. So tell us what you've maybe done that hasn't worked for you, and or tell us what you're thinking about doing in 2018. Maybe it's doubling up on more advertising or this, this new thing that you're going to try. Um, and anybody want anything, any, any failures anybody wants to share? I do um, one. Or, okay, Fred? The uh, direct mail advertising, 1,000 uh, postcards a month, 1,000 homes didn't produce one result, not one return call. So that tells me uh, if the message is not right. right. And it was designed by the best uh, people in the industry, recommended by CAR, and all of that. But <laughs>